Well, good morning. I thought this morning we'd begin with some confession, right? And I thought maybe I'd pick one of you, but then I thought, well, maybe that's not fair. So I'll do the confessing this morning. So I'm going to make a confession to you this morning, and it's this. I hate waiting, all right? Feels good to get that out in the open. Any of you with me? All right. Waiting, you know, there's just nothing, nothing fun about waiting, is there? I don't like waiting, you know, and, and maybe you're like me when you're, you're at the store, you're at the grocery store, you're at Walmart, you're somewhere and you're getting ready to check out and what do you do? You wait, but, but before you wait, you sort of start to survey the lines, right? And, and you start to think, that one's moving a little bit faster than that one, and maybe that one looks shorter, and then you, you think you pick the right one, and then all of a sudden, you know, the line that you pick, the cash register breaks, or somebody can't figure out how to write their check, and you're like, why are you still writing checks? We have cards now. <laughs> the struggle is real. I don't like waiting. Waiting is hard. Waiting isn't fun. But I want you to see with me this morning as we continue our journey with Joseph that waiting is often part of God's plan for our life. And waiting that's a lot, lot more difficult and has a lot more impact on our life than just waiting in line at the grocery store. Waiting is often part of God's will for our lives, but waiting is hard. And a lot of times God will place us in what I would call waiting patterns in life where we just don't seem to see what he's doing. God doesn't seem to be actively answering our prayers. He, he doesn't seem to be responding to our cries. And, and we really struggle to understand what is God up to in my life. And, and we're going to see as we continue Joseph's journey today that, that Joseph was in a waiting period in life. And we're going to learn from Joseph some things about how God would have us to wait. Joseph, if you'll remember... As we pick up his story, he grew up in his father's home as daddy's favorite. Quite a dysfunctional home, but a pretty good life because he was the favorite. He sold out by his brothers to Ishmaelite traders at the age of 17, shipped off to Egypt, bought by a man named Potiphar, and life gets better as he is promoted to rule Potiphar's house. But then you'll remember, as we left off yesterday, he's been accused falsely of attempted rape, and he's been thrown into prison. And there Joseph is waiting, waiting on God to do something on his behalf. And God does something on his behalf. And as we said yesterday, maybe not exactly what Joseph wanted, but what Joseph most needed. And at the end of Genesis 39, we'll see that, that God was with Joseph in prison, that, that God didn't abandon or, or give up on Joseph. In fact, he didn't give Joseph maybe what he wanted, which was his freedom, but he gave him what he needed, which was himself. And the Bible says that God was with Joseph and he blessed Joseph in prison. And here's the crazy thing. God's favor was so great on his life and Joseph's faithfulness was so evident that the prison warden put Joseph in charge of the jail. All right, listen, that would be like your counselor putting you in charge of the hall. Are you with me? All right. Not a good idea. But it was a good idea for the prison warden because of who Joseph was. And so there's Joseph running the prison, but he's still in prison. It wasn't a pleasant place, it wasn't a comfortable place, and it wasn't an easy place. So let's pick up Joseph's journey in Genesis 40 this morning, and, and we're going to just sort of summarize portions of the narrative and then focus in on a few verses uh, this morning as we think about the subject of waiting. So Genesis chapter 40 and summarizing verses 1 through 22. If you have your Bible open, you can kind of look along. But I'm going to just move through this quickly. But Joseph is, is in prison. He's running the prison. And one day they get two new prisoners. And they're quite notorious because they're two of uh, Pharaoh's high-ranking people. One is his chief cupbearer. All right, the chief cupbearer was somebody who tasted the king, the Pharaoh's wine and food to make sure that it wasn't poison, to make sure it, wasn't safe, make sure it was safe. Uh, he was also a confidant, an advisor to Pharaoh. He was a very, very influential fellow. And then there was the baker, all right? And he threw both of them into prison. And we don't, we don't really know the circumstances of, of what caused Pharaoh to become frustrated with these men, but he threw them into prison. And the Bible says that they were placed under Joseph's care. And so Joseph began to get to know these men. Well, one day, uh, early in the morning, they wake up, and Joseph can see that both of the men are really troubled. You know, both of them are just really, really looking down. And, and Joseph just goes over to him and says, guys, what's wrong? 
And, and it was more than just, well, dude, we're in prison, right? You know, but it was, they were troubled. And they both said, you know, we had dreams last night, Re really intense dreams, crazy dreams. And we think they mean something, but we can't figure it out. And Joseph said, mm, I know something about dreams, right? And he says, God is able to interpret dreams. Tell me your dreams and I'll reveal them to you. So the, the cupbearer, uh, he shares his dream and, and, and it was kind of something like this. His dream, uh, he dreamed about, about this branch, that three branches and leaves and there was clusters of grapes on it. And he says, he says in my dream, I, I was taking these grapes and I was squeezing them by hand in a Pharaoh's cup and I was, I was giving it to him. And, and, and Joseph listens, and as he's listening, I'm sure he's praying and asking God for the revelation. And he says, I've got some good news for you. Here's what your dream means. He says, in three days, Pharaoh is going to lift you up out of prison, and, and he is going to restore you to your position as his chief cupbearer. Good news. You only got three more days here. Well, the baker, he, he's uh, you know, listening, and, and he's like, wow, that's great. So he's like, hey, Joseph, can, can I tell you about my dream? And Joseph said, sure. So he said, well, here's my dream. He said, you know, I had baked all kinds of goods for, for Pharaoh, and it kind of looks like he was trying to do like Krispy Kreme donuts. But, you know, you can't imitate the original, and I think maybe that's where he went wrong. But anyway, he was carrying them on his head, and the birds began to come and eat them. And so, you know, pretty, pretty crazy dream. Anybody have a dream that crazy last night? All right, a few of you. <laughs> So Joseph says, here is your interpretation. And the baker's like, yeah, yeah, tell me. He's like, well, in three days, Pharaoh's going to lift you up, but he's also going to lift your head off of your shoulders, and he's going to impale you on a pole, and the birds are going to eat your flesh. Have a good day. <laughs> and so Joseph is able to share their dreams with them. But... In the middle of that, we read something, right? Because this is also Joseph's moment of hope, right? There's a glimmer of hope now for Joseph, who's been stuck in this waiting pattern for years, right? His brothers have sold him out for, for many, for a long season. He served in Potiphar's house, and now he's been in jail. But now there's a chance, right? The, the cupbearer's getting out of prison, and this is his ticket out. And so he, he asked the cupbearer, look at verse 14. He says, but when all goes well with you, Remember me. Remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I've done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. And so Joseph says to the cupbearer, he's like, dude, he's like, remember me, man. Can you put a word into Pharaoh for me? I, I, I mean, I don't even deserve to be in Egypt, much, much less alone in prison. And of course, the cupbearer was like, dude, don't worry about it. I got you, right? I'll take care of you, right? It, don't, you've got nothing to worry about. So in three days, they're both released, and the, the baker is executed, and the cupbearer is restored to his position. But look at verse 23. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Forgot him. Forgot him. And I'm sure Joseph, you know, he was waiting. And you know, the first few days go by and he thinks, well, I understand. He's kind of got to get back to business and he's kind of got to get back in the flow of things. I'm sure he'll mention me to Pharaoh soon, probably by the end of the week. Well, the end of the week comes and nothing happens. And I'm sure he's thinking, well, probably next week, right? And, and then next week goes by. and Well, I'm sure sometime this month. But then... As the weeks turn to months and the months turn to years, Joseph realizes he's been forgotten, overlooked. Look at, look at chapter 41, verse 1. It says, when two full years had passed. Now, there's something about time. You know, there are a lot of times in life where time goes fast, like here at camp, right? I mean, it's like, you know, for you that are returning campers, you wait all year, right? You look forward to it. You anticipate it. You're excited about it. Some of you count down from the time you get home, right? Right? And then we get here and it goes by like what? Right? It just flies by. But when you're in an Egyptian dungeon, time doesn't go fast. Time goes real slow. Two 
full years on top of the time that he's already spent waiting. And you can imagine that, that even though he continues to have faith in God, right, there had to be some really difficult days of struggle for Joseph. God, why? Right, God, why, why did you let me be forgotten again? God, why, why aren't you answering my prayers? God, why? You gave me dreams, God. Why, why the waiting? God, it's not fair. It's not fair. I'm sure he wrestled with those feelings. I'm sure he wrestled with those feelings. It's been 13 years of waiting for Joseph. 13 years now as we get to chapter 41. But here's the thing. God was with him. He had not abandoned him. And God had not forgotten about the promises that he made. And God had not forgotten about the dreams that he had given him. And God was at work, and we're going to see that. Look in chapter 41, and I'm just going to highlight it for you, because we're going to find some more dreams. And this time, it's Pharaoh having dreams. All right, and Pharaoh has two very, very distinct and disturbing dreams. And they're depicted here for you. All right? First dream he has is about fat cows and skinny cows. All right, I don't know what he had for dinner the night before, but he has this fat cow, skinny cow dream, right? And so there's these fat, plump, healthy looking cows, and then there's these skinny, scrawny, kind of rough looking cows, all right? And in this dream, the skinny, scrawny cows eat the fat cows. And Pharaoh is really, really disturbed. And then he has another dream, and this time it's, it's heads of grain. And, and, and there's seven plump, beautiful, well-formed heads of grain, and then there are seven shriveled up, diseased, terrible-looking heads of grain. And, the, and the, the shriveled up, terrible-looking grain eats the plump, healthy grain, and Pharaoh wakes up. And Pharaoh realizes this is more than just your I ate too much pizza last night kind of a dream. Are you with me? And so he wants to know, what does this dream mean? And he goes to all of his men, all of his spiritual advisors, everybody that he might think could help him. And no one can answer his dream. No one can interpret it. He's getting agitated. He's getting irate. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer has the face palm moment of the century. All right, have you ever had a face palm moment? Like, ah, how could I have been so stupid? He goes, oh, there's this guy in prison. I was supposed to tell you about him and I forgot. And he can answer dreams. And Pharaoh's like, bring him here. And so they go and they get Joseph out of prison and they bring him before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, I've had these dreams and I've heard that you can interpret dreams. And Joseph's like, no, actually I can't. And Pharaoh's like, I'm killing somebody. <laughs> Joseph paused, but he said, but God can. So tell me your dreams, and God will give the interpretation. And so Pharaoh shares these dreams with Joseph, and Joseph says, here's, here's the meaning of the dreams, and you know the story. He says, there's going to be seven years of incredible abundance, seven years where God is going to bless, and the crops will be plentiful beyond Im uh, imagination. But after that will come seven years of famine, and there will be little to no food. And so Joseph interprets the dream and then he speaks wisdom to Pharaoh about what Pharaoh should do and how he should gather and store enough grain in the seven years so that there'll be food in the famine years. And he says, you know, I really recommend that you'd find someone who's intelligent and capable, and I want, think you should have them oversee the whole operation to ensure that there's enough food. And so Pharaoh calls a quick, you know, quick meeting with his advisors, and they're like, yeah, okay, uh -huh. yeah. They're like, Joseph, it's, it's going to be you. Who is as wise as you? If you're smart enough to figure out this dream, then you're smart enough to employ this program. And Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at this time and in this age, appoints Joseph to be his second in command. He gives him his signet ring, which gave him financial power and financial authority. He, he gives him new clothes. He gives him a wife, right? He gives him a new name. And he says, you are now the governor of Egypt. You are now second in command. And everywhere you go, people will do what you say. Look at verse 41 of chapter 41. Look, just look at where God has brought Joseph. It says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I've set, over, see, I've set you over all of the land of Egypt. 
And then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments, garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot. Check this out. And they called out before him. Like everywhere they took Joseph, they would call out before he came, bow the knee. And people would bow before Joseph. What a ride, huh? I mean, from growing up in his father's home as daddy's favorite to being sold to traitors and going to Potiphar's house and being promoted there and then thrown into prison. And now he's second in command of Egypt and people bow before him. And thus he was set over all of the land of Egypt. Bow the knee. Can you imagine what it was like for Joseph as they drove around? And, you know, I can just guess, and it's just a guess, that when they were driving around, he said, hey, can we swing by Potiphar's house? I wouldn't mind if his wife had to come out and bow. I'm sure they probably stopped by Potiphar's house. Bow the knee. You see, God had plans for Joseph's life. God had dreams for Joseph's life. God had a purpose for Joseph's life. But in order for Joseph to arrive at that purpose, and we're going to you know, see how this purpose is fully f- fleshed out as Joseph is placed in a position not just to save Egypt, but ultimately to save his family, the family through whom God was choosing to bless the world, the family through whom he would ultimately bring Jesus, our Messiah. God had incredible plans for Joseph, and those plans still have impact in this world today. But in order for Joseph to experience what God had for him, God required him to wait for 13 years. Listen, there are going to be times in life where God puts you and I into waiting patterns. I've been there. And it's not fun. And it's not easy. And it's not comfortable. But it's important. Waiting is not fun. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. It's lonely. It's hard, and it requires faith. Waiting is not easy. Waiting's not comfortable. Waiting can seem so frustrating, and and it might feel like God's ignoring you, right? Like, you know, you're in something, and there's this struggle, and there's this problem, and you've been praying about it. Like, I'm sure when Joseph was in prison, there wasn't a day that he didn't pray, God, help me to get out of here. I'm sure those last two years he was like, God, please, please let the cupbearer remember me. And every day, nothing. But you see, God's timing was not ready yet. If he had been released before this, he may have just ended up going back to Potiphar's house and it might not have been good or who knows what would have happened. God had a plan. God had a purpose. God had timing that was beyond his understanding. And God often does the same things in our life. We think we're ready. We think we know what's best. We think we know what God should do. Have you ever been there where you were just sure that you knew what God should do? Anybody willing to admit that? All right. I think all of us have been there, right? And, and, you know, so many times we think that, yes, I'm a servant of God and I should serve him in an advisory capacity, right? But you don't really want a God who takes your advice, do you? Think about, do you want a God who takes your advice? No. You want a God who can rescue you and redeem you, who's almighty, who's all-powerful, and who's all-knowing. You want a God who is able to save you and to deliver you and is ultimately able to bring you into his kingdom one day, not a God who takes your advice. Let me tell you, if you feel like God is ignoring you, if you feel like he's forgotten you, if you feel like he's overlooking you, I want you that nothing could be further from the truth. Because if you're God's child, if you come to him by faith and experience his grace in Jesus Christ, you're his child. And he will never, ever abandon you. He will never forget you. He will never ignore you. He's not ignoring you. And he is with you in the waiting periods. He's with you always. And his plans are greater and higher than you could ever ever understand. Waiting is not easy, but if you're going to follow Jesus, it's essential. If you're going to fulfill the plans that God has for you, if you were with us last week, we talked about the possible that God's marked over our life through the gospel. And if you are going to fulfill that possible, that perfect plan that God has for your life, 
There's going to be seasons and times where we have to wait. So just for a few moments this morning, I want us to just think about some practical advice. How do we, how do we walk through the waiting years, the waiting weeks, the waiting months, the waiting days? How do we, how do we live in the waiting times? And I, I want us from Joseph to see three things. Number one, don't panic. All right, sometimes it's easy in life to panic, isn't it? It's easy to panic. And one thing that we see in Joseph, and I'm sure Joseph had struggles. I'm sure Joseph had days of, of doubt. I'm sure Joseph had days of wondering. But in all of that, we see that Joseph didn't panic. Joseph never panicked. Corey Ten Boom, who we, we talked about earlier in the week, she said this. She said, there's no panic in heaven. God has no problems, only plans. And listen, this is written by someone who spent time in prison. Someone who spent time in a Nazi concentration camp. This is someone who watched her own sister die just days before they were liberated in that camp. It wasn't as though her life were easy. It wasn't though that everything was perfect, but she had learned something about God. She says, God never panics. Right, they're, they're, you know, in, in Joseph's life, you know, it wasn't that one day as God's looking down and he sees, he sees Joseph's brothers sell him to the Ishmaelite traders and God's like, oh my goodness, ha, ah, they're messing up my plan. And it wasn't like one day when, 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 when Potiphar's wife falsely accused him of rape and he was thrown into prison that God was like, no, 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 this is ruining everything. Right, but we all have those moments, don't we? Where we panic. Oh, this is wrong. This shouldn't happen. This is, this, everything's ruined now. But God never feels that way. Why? Because God never panics. He has no problems, only plans. Even when life looks out of control, feels out of control, seems out of control, know this, God is on his throne. God is ruling and reigning on the throne of this universe and you can trust him. Certainly Joseph struggled. Certainly he was lonely. Certainly he hurt. But he didn't panic. Don't panic. Your days and your destiny are in God's hand. Listen, your days, every day of your life, and God knows all of them from the beginning to the end, your destiny is held in the hand of God if you're his child. And so we can rest in that. Don't panic. Number two, be faithful. Your circumstances may be less than ideal. You may not be where you think you should be. God may not have done what you think he should do. You may not see anything changing. You may not see any hope. But what does God want you to do? He wants you to be faithful. Faithful to him. Faithful to his call in your life. Faithful to the things he's given you to do. Look at Joseph's life. You know how easy it would have been for Joseph to say, man, it's not fair. Man, I, I'm not working for Potiphar. Man, I'm not going to give a good effort. I don't deserve this. He doesn't deserve this. But what did Joseph do? He was faithful in Potiphar's house and he served well and God advanced him. He got thrown into prison and Joseph could have said, I don't deserve this. But instead he was faithful and God used him. And because of Joseph's faithfulness in his father's house growing up, because of his faithfulness in Potiphar's house as a servant, because of his faithfulness in prison, God was able to prepare him for his ultimate plans. You may not see what God is doing right now. It may not make sense, but God wants you to be faithful. Faithful to do what he's put in front of you. Faithful to him. Serve him. Walk close with him. Worship him. Be obedient. Sharpen and shape the talents, the gifts that God's given you. Be faithful in the waiting period. Joseph was faithful in the waiting years. And it positioned him for God's purposes and God's plans. Number three, live with hope. Live with hope. One of the things that we're going to see is that Joseph never let go of the dreams that God gave him. Joseph never let go. We're going to see tomorrow that, that Joseph never forgot the dreams that God had given him. You know, there are going to be times where life causes you to forget things. And it's in those moments that we have to go back and remember that what God has said and what God has done is true. You know, th there have been seasons and times in my life where, where I've struggled 
with doubt and I've struggled with worry and fear and all those things. And sometimes God has had to stop me and say, do you remember who I am? Do you remember what I've done? Do you remember what I have did for you? Do you remember that I've called you? And it's in those things I say, I can live with hope. God gave Joseph dreams and he never let go of that. But here's what I want you to know. God has given you more than he ever gave Joseph. God has given you more than he ever gave Joseph. Why? God has given you himself through Jesus. You see, that's the message of the gospel, right? The good news about God is this, is that even though you and I are sinful people, even though that you and I have rebelled in our hearts against our Creator, every single one of us, the Bible says, has gone our own way. The prophet Isaiah said, each of us gone our own way, away from God. Paul says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But, Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And when the Bible says that when we recognize our need of God and we come to Jesus, God's Son, who came to this earth, who lived and who died and who rose again, who ascended into heaven, who rules at His Father's hand and who's coming one day in power and in glory. The Bible says that when we recognize who Jesus is, we recognize our sin and by faith we accept Jesus' death on our behalf and we ask Him for His forgiveness and we ask Him for His grace for our sin and to enter into a covenant relationship with God through Christ by faith. When we experience that, we become God's child. We're adopted into His family. And not only do you belong to God, but the Bible says that God comes to live in you through the Holy Spirit. And so if you're in Christ today, if you know Jesus, not only are you in Christ, Christ is in you through, God, through the Holy Spirit. And so you have God in you, with you, so you can live with hope. God has given you Himself. He's given you His promises. He's given you purpose. He's given you meaning to live. He's given you his glory. And listen, one day he's going to give you his kingdom. I love this promise. I shared it with you earlier. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, fear not, little flock. Fear not. Why? It is the Father's good pleasure to give you his kingdom. Listen, Jesus said, in this life, you'll have waiting periods. In this life, you'll have trials and tribulations. But be of good cheer, because I have overcome this world. This world is not all there is. This life is not all there is. And our hope, ultimately, is anchored in the fact that God has promised us through Jesus resurrection life. Resurrection life in a new body, in a new creation. And so he says, fear not. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. When you don't understand what God's doing and when you're in those waiting periods, man, that's a verse that you can go back and say, man, I don't know what God's doing right now and I don't understand why he's allowed circumstances to be the way they have. But God said it's his good pleasure to give me his kingdom. I can trust him. We, don't, we will have to wait in life. You'll have to wait. There will be waiting times. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you'll be there one day. But God will call you to wait. And it's not fun, and it's not easy, and if you're impatient like me, it can be really frustrating. But you can live without panic, because God has a plan. He's on the throne. You can live in faith, you can trust Him, and you can live with hope. Psalm 138, verse 8. The Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. For your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. God is more concerned about fulfilling the purposes that he has for you than you are. And even if you're like, I want to live for Jesus and I want to live for God, God wants that even more than you do. You can trust that he will fulfill his plans and his purposes for you if you're surrendered to him. And let me pray for you this morning. And just, just with no one looking around this morning and just in the quietness of this moment, just very quickly, you'd say, you know what, I, I really feel like I'm stuck in a waiting pattern and I'm kind of struggling with understanding what God's doing. Would you pray for me? Would you just raise your hand so I could pray for you? No one's looking at you. Thank you so much. Appreciate your courage. Let me pray for all of you this morning. Father, I thank you for time together this morning to open your word, which is living and powerful and true. And Father, I thank you for the ability that your word has to speak into our hearts and to our lives. Father, I thank you for Joseph and how you recorded his story for us that we might learn about how you work in our lives. And Father, I just pray that in the seasons of waiting, 
that you would help us to keep our eyes focused and fixed on you. And Father, that we would trust you in those valleys, knowing that you are ultimately working out your purposes and plans. Father, help us not to panic, but to trust you. Help us to be faithful to you. And Father, help us to live with your incredible hope. Father, you saw each hand this morning. Father, you saw the heart that raised that hand. And Father, I pray that you might minister your grace and your hope and your encouragement powerfully in their lives. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.